Two former editors at a British newspaper owned by Rupert Murdoch are being prosecuted for illegal phone hacking. Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson were two of eight former News of the World employees who will face criminal charges. I have concluded that a prosecution is required in the public interest in relation to each of those eight suspects. In a hearing last week, Ms. Brooks condemned phone hacking. Um, what happened at the News of the World and certainly when the allegations of voice intercepts voicemail intercepts of victims of crime is pretty horrific and abhorrent. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. I'm Catherine Rampell, reporting for Business Day Live. We'll have an interview with Neil Borofsky, the former policeman for bank bailouts, and we'll look at what happens to schools and teachers when fewer students enroll. But first, I have Michael De La Merced here to talk about China's latest energy investments. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Catherine. So you have a story today about how China is in the is planning, I guess, is in the works of buying a Canadian um, oil company. Why is that so significant? Sure. Well, this is China's latest effort to basically add to its energy capacity. China has been in an almost desperate search to keep adding new sources of oil, and um, this is its biggest effort yet, with its $15 billion bid for a company called Nexon up in Canada. So why are they on this, this um, effort to gobble up all of these different energy companies? I mean, is it that they want another source of revenue? Is it to keep their economy functioning, or what? Sure. Well, everyone talks about the growth of China's economy, how it's the big wonder in the world. It takes oil to keep that going, and so it's been on a hunt to find new sources of oil. Um, some analysts estimate that it's going through about 9 million barrels of oil a day, and so it needs to keep finding new places. And so a lot of what China's been doing is entering into joint ventures or they're taking minority stakes in oil companies, but they haven't really tried buying whole oil companies since 2005. Well, and why is it so significant that they're buying something outright? I mean, sure. it, this has to do with the fact that they need approval, right? I mean, it's, they can't just go out and, and, and buy a Canadian or an American oil company. That's right. And, and so the big uh, date is 2005, and that's when they tried to buy an American oil company called Unical. But that got shot down by U.S. regulators because of basically national security concerns. And for years afterwards, China was just pretty afraid of trying to wade back into those waters and sort of test those regulatory approvals. But since then, they've tried to be a bit more cautious. They've talked a good game about playing nicely with other countries, with regulators and so forth. So this is the first time in a long time that they've actually tried to buy an entire company on the North American continent. And in this case, they need approval not only from Canadian regulators, but American ones and Nigerian run ones, is that right? Uh, definitely American ones, British ones, maybe British Nigerians. Ones, right. uh, there are a lot of regulators that they need to go through. And a lot of people think this is going to be a big test of what China can do in terms of getting through an approval process. Why would regulators in America or Canada um, object to sure. China's purchase of something like this? Well, oil is seen as a big national security asset, and um, because there are so many questions about what Chinese companies will do, especially state-run ones like this one, it's called Sinook, that people are a little wary of letting Chinese companies get their hands on something like this. So there's bound to be a lot of process, and already in Canada, there's a lot of talk about whether or not this should go through. And so you have the Prime Minister, who has sort of indicated he's softening a little bit in terms of whether he'll allow Chinese investments to go through. But the opposition party is already making a lot of noise saying, well, we're, we're not sure about this deal. We think we should put it on hold. So it sounds like we, we still have a ways to go before this is resolved. Uh, it's entirely possible it'll be a long way. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. At the height of the financial crisis, Neil Borofsky had a tough job. He was charged with monitoring the $700 billion troubled asset relief program, more commonly or fondly known in the media as TARP. The former federal prosecutor has a new book out today about how the Bush and Obama administrations may have mishandled bank bailouts using taxpayer dollars. He sat down with my colleague, Winnie O'Kelly. When I got to Washington, what I saw was that Washington has essentially been hijacked by the interests of a small group of very, very powerful financial institutions from Wall Street. Um, and they have taken over and captured the ideology of, of the regulators, which is what I saw when I got down there. Um, all the people I was dealing with 
basically had come from Wall Street. You know, uh, when I started making recommendations, I saw all these loopholes, these um, no strings attached terms of the bailouts. And when I would start pointing them out to, to, to the regulars, to the people working for TARP and the Treasury, it started in 08 and really continued 09, 10, until I left in 2011, mm -hmm. I would often get the same response, which was sort of a pat on the head and saying, you know, Neil, you don't understand, you don't get it. These banks, like, they're not going to take advantage of these loopholes. They're not going to commit mm -hmm. fraud. They would never risk their reputation. So that sort of brings us to today. I mean, one of the current scandals brewing is over LIBOR. And, and now we have a lot of discussion about what regulators knew and when. Do you think that there was a, a blind eye turned toward what seemed to be misdeeds? I mean, I think blind eye is almost a, a kind way of, of mm -hmm. putting what it appears happened. I mean, we, we know, we don't know a lot, but what we do know from some of the documents that were released was that the New York Federal Reserve, starting in 2007 and through the spring of 2008, was told in pretty unambiguous terms by Barclays uh, that they were participating uh, in potentially an international conspiracy mm -hmm. to fix, to manipulate the single most important interest rate in the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the tapes that were released and, and some of the transcripts show that they were potentially confessed to a massive crime. And the response was unbelievably underwhelming. You know, several bailout programs used the LIBOR interest rate to determine how the taxpayer would be paid back, a rate that they, know, they, they knew was being ongoing, being manipulated. Assuming that regulators, indeed, uh, and Treasury and others during the financial crisis took the best steps they could at a time of great crisis, which is a bit of an assumption, but if they did, uh, now with some hindsight, we could go back and say, what would we do differently? What do you think could be done differently in Washington? Doing the best that they could, I, I, I reject that, because mm -hmm. they could have done what they did and done more. Does Treasury ask top recipients what they are doing with the money? Do they ask them the question? Overall, no. You know, Congress didn't give the money just to bail out the banks. And Treasury promised when they got the money, they would do more than just throw a whole bunch of money at the system. Mm -hmm. They were going to restore lending. They were going to invigorate the economy by, by getting the banks to deploy that money, preserving home ownership and addressing the foreclosure crisis. So all of those things could have been done, and the choices were made not to do them. If we want to prevent another financial crisis, and we are heading down the road towards another financial crisis, we need to finally learn the lessons of 2008. We need to address the too-big-to-fail banks and all the perversions that come with having the implicit uh, government guarantee, the presumption of bailout, which is still very much alive and well today. You know, we need, and, and for that, frankly, we need to break up the banks. Um, they know that the government isn't going to indict one of them. J.P. Morgan Chase isn't going to get indicted uh, because they know that if that happened, it would risk bringing down the entire financial system. That incentivizes criminal behavior, fraud, going across up to the line and over it. When schools lose students, the whole community feels it. Matoko Rich joins me now with more on why school enrollment is shrinking and what it means. Hi, Matoko. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Catherine. You have a story today about how teachers are losing their jobs, um, not only because states and, and municipalities are cutting back um, on their funding, but also because the students themselves are are uh, enrolling Leaving. in fewer numbers. Right. right. So at least in some districts. Right. Why is that happening? Well, these are some of the nation's largest districts, and in close to half of the largest, 100 largest districts in the country have seen declining enrollment over the last five years. And part, there are many reasons for that. The economy has a role to play. So the foreclosure crisis means a lot of people have moved from one place to another. So they may have moved from a, a more central area out to a much further but suburb. But so on net, it should be the same. Right, right, but we're talking about enrollment in individual districts and mm -hmm. what it does to those districts. So okay. when a particularly large district, and in certain places like Cleveland and Detroit, we've seen some what could be fairly described as hemorrhaging of numbers of students coming out of those districts for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But in other places like Broward County, Florida, San Bernardino, California, Mesa, Arizona, the economy has certainly affected that, that people have had to move out. There's also been a lot of immigration changes. So either people have lost their jobs, construction was a huge employer of mm -hmm. immigrants, and so a lot of those people may have gone home to their home countries. Also, there have been legal crackdowns. So there are a lot of reasons why districts are losing. The other reason is charter schools. There's been a strong movement to build more charter schools and start new charter schools within or nearby to these districts. And so parents are making choices to move their kids out of these 
public traditional public schools into the charter schools. Why is it such a big deal, though? I mean, so so you have fewer students. That means you right. have fewer teachers. Why? Right. You know, right. that, I mean, that should mean that the the student to teacher ratio should stay about the same. Exactly. Right? So on the on, on that level, that's a fair point. On the other hand, so we're not really seeing an increase in class size because of decline in enrollment and layoff and subsequent layoff of teachers. What we are seeing, though, is that if you lay off, if you lose a certain number of students, then you no longer have enough students to support a music program in a particular school. You might not even have enough students to keep the, the, the physical building open. So they have to start closing schools, consolidating the students that are left into one building, and you have this old building left. There are certain, if you have 700 students in a school or 400 students in a school, you still need one principal. That principal's salary remains the same. You can't lay off the principal or hire two-thirds of a principal. So a lot of those costs stay the same. And then we're seeing the effects of that is that students are losing out on music, art, uh, all kinds of other extracurricular programs. And I imagine programs. there's sort of a vicious cycle here, right? Yes. Because as as the school loses programs, that encourages more parents to send exactly. their students to other schools. Right, exactly. They see that as a sort of quote unquote failing district, not providing the opportunities that they fairly want for their kids. And so they are sending them to other schools, moving to other wealthier districts, or sending them to charter schools or private schools. What are the broader economic effects of these teachers getting laid off and, and people moving out of these districts? Right. Well, certainly on the teacher layoffs, as we've talked about previously about public workers in general, they're workers. And when they lose jobs, and if they can't find another new job, then they aren't able to spend and, and sort of spur the consumer spending in the economy. For the schools themselves, um, a lot of times that they're left with the poorest students who then are not potentially not getting the education that students in other areas and there's a, a increasing inequity that we've been talking a lot about in our economy. Which I'm sure reduces the opportunity for those students. Absolutely. Right? Well Motoko, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. That's all for today. Please stay with us online at nytimes.com for our continuing coverage of these and other stories. I'm Katherine Rampell reporting for Business Day Live. Thanks for watching.